Uh, Drew, thank you very, very much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the State Department. And uh, Drew, thanks so much for not just uh, great leadership, but for years of friendship. Drew was really the surrogate senator for the state of Massachusetts for a period of time. He was my director up there in the state and uh, did an absolutely magnificent job. Uh, John, Jeremy, Andrea, thank you so much uh, for being here uh, and helping us kick off uh, this forum. Thank you all for being here. It wouldn't be a forum without all of you here. And I am particularly grateful uh, for your joining us this week. Uh, so let me build off that very generous uh, introduction and put it to everybody pretty simply. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that how we confront climate change uh, will be certainly one of two of the defining issues of our generation and perhaps the defining issue of our generation because of the stakes. The other being uh, the rise of radical extremism, sectarianism, and the failure of states simultaneously surrounding it, and vast populations of young people needing jobs instead of mind-bending theories of false assumptions about Islam and other things. Both are gigantic challenges. But thankfully, the solution to this particular challenge, climate change, is actually just as simple as the realization that it is, the challenge that it is. And as I have said countless times, including this past weekend, when I had the privilege of speaking at the Milan Expo uh, in, uh, about the connections between climate change and food security and global security writ large, uh, the solution to climate change is not generations away. It is not that difficult to comprehend. It is not a mystery waiting to be solved. It is, put quite simply, energy policy, clean energy choices. And it's staring us in the face. The opportunities are there. Many of the solutions are already developed. And as all of you know, as capital moves in those directions and as the economics begin to change, everybody else will begin to make a different set of choices. That's precisely why we have invited you all here today. It's why I'm, I'm really delighted to see such an extraordinary group, and you are extraordinary because you already get it, and you're already acting on it. Uh, and so we have investment leaders here today representing trillions of dollars of assets under management, focused not on abstract discussions, but on real, tangible initiatives that will actually bring about a clean and sustainable future. Now, I am well aware that I am speaking to an audience of experts. Uh, none of you need to be converted. And none of you, I'm sure, probably need to be exhorted, though exhort you, I will. Particularly if you've been working in this space, you know that achieving a global agreement on climate change at the Paris conference this December is an absolutely critical step and a major priority of President Obama, myself, and the rest of the administration. Uh, but we also know that even the kind of ambitious and durable and inclusive agreement with all of the advances that we have made since I first went to China two years ago to begin the negotiation with them to try to change what prompted the failure in Copenhagen, which was this great divergence between developed and developing countries. Since then, we have made actually enormous progress, and yet we know, even going into Paris, it will not get the job done. And so it's becoming even more clear with every record-breaking drought, every record-breaking flood, every hottest month ever announcement, or every year hottest year that we live through, with every peer-reviewed study that details the catastrophe that climate change could unleash, and frankly, that we're seeing already in certain places. You know, the canary in the gold mine, in the, in the, in the coal mine, uh, indicators, which are many in various parts of the world, particularly the Arctic and Antarctic and in some other places, uh, 
they all begin to detail the catastrophe that climate change has the potential to unleash. And with every passing day, it is actually getting more urgent that we get the job done, and we have to reach an agreement in Paris that will serve as the foundation for a low-carbon, climate-resilient future worldwide. But the road through Paris is paved with investment decisions that you're going to make not tomorrow, but today. Not in December, but in the next weeks, hopefully. And in the projects that we are working on and building together. Now, decades of science tell us that unless we make that transition, we are facing irreversible impacts to infrastructure, food production, water supply, sea level, ecosystems, and potentially to human life itself on this planet. And the wake-up call is not new. Year after year, the science has been screaming at us. And as time goes on, we are seeing the warning, warning uh, cries of climate change, frankly, rising all over the world. The past decade was the hottest on record. The one before that, the second hottest on record. The one before that, the third hottest on record. 19 of the 20 hottest years in history have occurred in the past two decades. So the warning isn't new, but I'll tell you this, the alarm bells are getting louder. Now, someone who is younger than 29 years old today, 29 or younger, has not lived through a single month cooler than its 20th century average. And the good news is that even as we get a better and better understanding of the dangers of our carbon-based economy, we are also getting a better understanding of the many, many ways that we could improve the way that we power our world. So my friends, the opportunities really are endless. I was in Spain yesterday, and I met a young man who has designed a smart heating system. I went to the Google uh, Center there, and on the first floor it's open to the public, and they had some demos of various uh, entrepreneurs who are young kids starting up incredible things. Uh, and one of them had a smart heating system, and it's based on intelligent tiles that help users create heating zones to, to help target energy use, so that ultimately less energy is required to help people stay warm in cold weather. Pretty simple concept. There are lots of other variations of that in various ways that are out there and beginning to emerge. But in the age of the smartphone, when we can do this remotely and find and track what's happening, we have incredible means of providing efficiencies. And efficiency, as we all know, is one of the lowest hanging fruits. Grab, easy. And there are many places where they haven't even begun to reach for the low-hanging fruit. So you could, you could control this particular system from your iPhone and remote. But it's the kind of innovative thinking that we need to see take root in every corner of the globe. It is the future. And it'll take the investments at all stages, from venture capitalists to pension funds, from project developers to green bonds, to begin to make it happen. Everybody here has a role to play in accelerating this movement towards the low-carbon economy. And the real kicker is, and I think most of you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway for the benefit of folks tuning into this, that the, that the real kicker is that innovations in clean energy and energy efficiency, they don't just help stave off the worst impacts of climate change. They're also going to grow our economies. And they're going to employ our communities. And I don't have to explain to anybody here how big an opportunity that is. I can, you know, for 28 years I served in the Senate, and it was rare that you got a really great plus back, positive return on a particular vote or choice that you made. If it was one for one, you were doing pretty well. Climate change is what? Four, five, six for one. Because you get better health, better economy, better security, better environmental responsibility, better uh, reduction of costs in hospitals. Run the list. The, the cost accounting here is really pretty simple. And it's pretty extraordinary to me that we haven't had more smart graduates of, of various business schools around the country who are leading corporations around America and the world who haven't raised the the, the profile of this need to really account for things more correctly. Because everybody says, oh my God, we can't do that, it's too expensive. What's well, not, if you consider the cost of not doing it? The cost accounting 
It's pretty simple. On one side of the ledger, you have the cost of inaction. And most people don't ever file that cost. Then you have the cost of unimaginable environmental and agricultural degradation of hospital bills for asthma. Biggest single cause of children in America being hospitalized in the course of the summer is environmentally induced asthma, and it costs us billions of dollars. We have millions of deaths linked to air pollution caused by the fossil fuels that we burn and the particulates that are in the atmosphere. The cost of rebuilding after devastating storms and flooding. Last year in the United States, there were eight separate weather events in which the cost for those eight alone exceeded a billion dollars. And globally, I guarantee you, we spent well more than $100 billion, and we're struggling to put together $100 billion for annual expenditure in order to deal with mitigation and other things to bring less developed countries to the table. Shame on us. You all have an ability, actually, to impact that with the leveraging and choices you make with respect to your investments. So that's just the first page of the ledger. The list goes on and on, and infrastructure maintenance in the face of rising seas, stronger storms, power outages, labor productivity losses due to extreme heat, all of that, uh, not, not, not to mention the uh, uh, extraordinary costs of insurance losses. The insurance business is already ready to sign up increasingly across the world. So all of that has to be added to the cost of the wait and see approach of climate change. And compare all of that to the upsides. Multi-trillion dollar market that has potential to create millions of jobs, making people healthier, communities safer, ecosystems cleaner, and the world more secure. What's that worth? This is not a very complicated balance sheet, and the bottom line is really crystal clear. And thankfully, more and more business leaders are coming to exactly that conclusion. Google, as co-sponsor of this forum, is today announcing its investment in the Lake Turkana wind project in Kenya. This investment will bring 310 megawatts of cheap, clean, and renewable energy into Kenya's grid. And once constructed, it will be the biggest wind farm in all of Africa and the single largest private sector investment in Kenya's history. At the White House Clean Energy Investment Summit last June, a consortium of long-term investors committed to build a new multi-billion dollar intermediary that will identify, screen, and assess companies and projects for the commercial investment that also produce impactful and profitable solutions to climate change. And that consortium will officially launch today as Aligned Intermediary, or AI. And later this afternoon, you'll hear from his co-founder and CEO, Peter Davidson, who will discuss the extraordinary investment capital commitments that AI has already received and introduce the members of the advisory board who have helped to deliver this remarkable commitment of capital for AI's work. Now, OPIC signed a new agreement to provide up to $400 million in financing for the Redstone Concentration Solar Power Project in northern Cape South Africa. And a large scale, it's a large-scale solar facility uh, being developed by Solar Reserve, an American company, and uh, Aqua Power, which is a Saudi firm. Now, I know many of you here today are pursuing similar investments, and I really couldn't be more grateful, and I say that less as a Secretary of State and more as a parent and grandparent, because these are the kinds of projects that are going to help the world transition to a low-carbon economy. They're the kinds of projects that will help us honor our responsibility to future generations. They're the kind of projects that literally can save the world. And the State Department, Georgetown, and Google came together to convene this conference in the hopes that the connections you make over the next two days, the discussions that you'll have, the opportunities that you'll discover, will unleash a wave of new interest and new investment and new innovation in the technologies and adaptation strategies that will change the energy game. And we also hope we can, uh, we can diversify the flows of public and private climate finance. And today, 90 percent of private climate finance is invested into projects in the same country from which the money originated. And we need to develop better pathways to sustainable development into new and emerging markets. And we can't solve climate change at home if you ignore what is happening abroad, because increasingly it is developing countries that are coming online, and unfortunately too many of them forced into a coal-fired power plant without any uh, remediation whatsoever, and obviously that's a disaster. So our goal is to find ways to 
accelerate collaboration across borders and sectors. And I assure you, we in this administration want to help move you forward, not hold you back, not stand in your way. And this afternoon at lunch, you're going to hear from a few programs uh, uh, that, the, uh, that we have designed to facilitate more private investment into climate and clean energy projects in emerging markets. For example, today we are launching the Clean Energy Finance Facility uh, for the Caribbean and Central America, which was an initiative first unveiled by President Obama last April. And we know that our neighbors in the Caribbean and Central America have abundant renewable energy resources. And yet they suffer from electricity shortages and high prices. In Jamaica, a kilowatt hour costs nearly four times as much as in the U.S. And this program is going to provide early stage funding, including uh, $10 million in its first year alone to clean energy projects to help catalyze greater public and private sector investment that will make all the difference. And tomorrow you'll hear from my friend and colleague, Gurney Moniz, Secretary of Energy, uh, over at Georgetown University, our generous co-sponsors for this forum, and thank you, Jack, very much for that. Uh, Ernie will discuss the steps his department is taking to commercialize new clean energy technologies and help achieve our climate goals. In December, Ernie and I are going to join representatives around the world in Paris. I think the longest that, I, that any Secretary of State has any, ever been out of country in one place was my uh, vacation in Vienna with the Iranians, uh, the, the 19 plus days that I was there. But next to that, I will be in Paris from almost November 30th through the end in order to try to help make sure we can achieve what we want to and close an ambitious and durable climate agreement. So let no one doubt that a global agreement is an essential part of this. But ultimately, my friends, I got to tell you, because of the problem, and by the way, even as federal governments in many cases may be restrained, uh, <laughs> yeah, for, you know, we're our own worst enemy in many, in many ways. We have politicians today who refuse to utter the words climate change let alone do something to address it. But thankfully, President Obama and many of his counterparts view things differently, and, and they're joined by entrepreneurs, scientists, activists, others. We just had an event here a week or so ago with Mike Bloomberg in which we brought mayors from around the world, and mayors are beginning to do things at local levels, getting way ahead of the federal governments. Grassroots may be the saving grace, and you are grassroots. And if you all make the right set of investments and the market begins to get the message out of Paris, what we have to hope for and I think even count on is that there will be a remarkable multiplier effect that comes from the signal sent that more than 150 nations have now signed on with their intended national determined uh, contributions, that is, their reductions. And frankly, I, I think we can safely say that did come about because we partnered with a less developed country, a giant of one as it is, China, and sent a message we can no longer afford to play by the same old rules of fighting each other and not all of us collectively becoming part of this solution. So I thank you profoundly for being part of this forum. And over the next uh, two days, I think we can do a lot to help get the job done. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, President Joya, Mr. Grantham. It is great for me to be here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said today that the warning isn't new, but the alarm bells are getting louder. Um, how do you tell these investors uh, that we can address the political crisis we have in that uh, you have a, a Congress that rejected cap and trade in 2010. The president is trying to do what he can by executive action through the EPA, but that is a slower and much more expensive process and litigious. And at the same time, you have a leading Republican candidate who tweeted out that on the first day of fall, the first cold weather, that this was proof that uh, we need more global warming. You have Republican oh, candidates. <laughs> Republican candidates are not only silent on the subject, they are client, climate deniers. Uh, and even candidates who led the way in 2008, the nominee, is now silent on the subject because of Tea Party challenges 
to himself and to others. Sure. In the Democratic Party, you have many labor interests that are pressing also against restrictions on coal and other fossil fuels. So you've got, you've got gridlock in both parties and uh, an election year where this is not even being discussed. Well, it will be discussed. I'm confident of that once we get through the primaries. Uh, because I know that whoever it is nominated by the Democratic Party is going to make this a very important part of, uh, of our choice for the country. But beyond that, um, you know, I've heard this, I mean, I've debated it on the floor of the Senate. I've heard it. I've testified before the Environment Committee. So I know all the counter arguments to it. But when I hear a United States Senator say I'm not a scientist, so I can't make a judgment or a candidate for president for that matter, I'm absolutely astounded. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's incomprehensible that a grown-up who has been to high school and college in the United States of America disqualifies themselves because they're not a scientist when they've learned that the Earth rotates on its axis, but they're not a scientist, where they've learned that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and it does so 24 hours a day. And you can run the list of things that we know science tells us happens, and we accept it every single day. And to suggest that when, you know, more than 6,000 plus peer-reviewed studies of the world's best scientists all lay out that this is happening and mankind is contributing to it, uh, it seems to me that they disqualify themselves fundamentally from high public office with those kinds of statements. And I think the American people will decide that this year because the American people are overwhelmingly in favor of doing something about climate change. Mr. Mr. Grantham, uh, at a time where we are in such a slow growth economy where there are warnings, including some of your own, about financial crises to come, how do you persuade investors that this is good business? that this makes economic sense. Uh, we were talking earlier that um, the best thing to do in a forum like this is to ignore the question um, and, and get, get to the heart of the matter. Please do. And um, <laughs> I have less career risk than my colleagues uh, sitting with me and, and probably any of you, and therefore I'm a good person to try and uh, rouse the rabble. Uh, Secretary Kerry said that you didn't need converting. But I wonder if there's anyone here who feels he couldn't uh, be a little more outspoken on this issue, which is existential. It will determine the success of our stable society or not. I wonder if there's anyone here who couldn't do a better job and speak out a little more. And let me just give credit to the enemy, the obfuscators. They are much better at speaking out. We have people like Richard Lindzen, the infamous professor at MIT, who supported tobacco as doing no harm and now supports fossil fuels as being healthy. Uh, we have uh, Viscount Ridley and what I call the loony lords in England, who uh, even yesterday he had a, a, a new article in the Telegraph saying that uh, there was no such thing as carbon dioxide, it was good for you. We have the Koch brothers and the Cato Institutes they do a very good job at obfuscation. They speak out all the time. And we're not so good. Our climate scientists are too nervous. They're protecting the dignity of the science. We have a Jim Hansen here and somebody over there. But in general, they don't. I've yet to meet a climate scientist who doesn't think the situation is much worse than is generally understood and that it's accelerating. We have politicians, one here, Thank heavens, Secretary Kerry, and one there, but in general, much more silent than they need to be. A, a, a quick word on Trudeau, hallelujah. Uh, Canada, who used to be good, was captured by Alberta and the fossil industry, and unexpectedly, uh, the Albertan uh, fossil fuelers were thrown out by the Liberals, and now we have a much greener, uh, unexpected uh, Prime Minister. We have the odd mayor, of great cities here and there. They're not actually bad at all, but uh, a Bloomberg here and someone over there, but not enough. The pension funds, no direct ownership yet of wind or solar. Where are they? We have a CalPERS here and someone over there, but not too many. They're not pulling their weight. Corporate offices, we have a Unilever here 
and let me think. Yes, one or two. If you get it, you have to state it loudly and clearly and often or we will fail. University presidents, well, not yet, present company accepted. But we have high hopes that someone soon will get it and speak out and set a good example. We have a pope here and there. Well, there's only one pope. But, and thank heavens for Pope Francis. That's career risk. He knew he was going to get hammered, and he still did it. Uh, we have uh, a Bank of England governor here and there. I mean, what an achievement that was for, um, for him to speak out and, uh, and say what he did about uh, the climate. The future for all of us will depend on a few thousand people uh, taking some career risk and, and putting it on the line and making it clear that they, they see this as a real crisis, people like you. So that's my harangue. Uh, President DeJoya, following up on that, we all were inspired by uh, Pope Francis's visit and his speech and his addressing the climate issue. How, how does that translate uh, throughout the hierarchy and also to your students. Sure, sure. Um, in what was the most anticipated encyclical, a circulating letter from the Holy Father in probably a half a century. And we had been expecting this for more than a year. Uh, it did not disappoint. Um, it, it truly was an extraordinary moment and had served already to inspire us to try to determine how could we as a university community respond differently in this moment. Over the last couple of years, we've taken a couple steps. First and foremost, academically, how can we ensure that the resources of a university are able to respond effectively? In our case, there are a lot of players in the field of, of environmental science. We tried to determine what could a place like Georgetown, the oldest Catholic and Jesuit university in the United States, with a global network of relations and partners, but located here in Washington. What might we be able to do differently? And what we, we've tried to do is harness the power of the disciplines. The great strength of universities is disciplinary knowledge, but the great challenges that we face, like climate change, require the integration of those disciplines. So the, the part of Georgetown that's responsible for co-sponsoring this event our Social Enterprise Institute comes out of our business school. From our science departments, from our liberal arts programs, our law school does extraordinary work in addressing issues related to climate change. What we've tried to do with the Georgetown Environment Initiative, which came to us through a, sig a significant gift from a member of our community, was harness the power of the whole institution to look at the integration of policy, law, business, science, and try to make the kinds of contributions that, that universities can make to this, to this dialogue. The Holy Father has provided us with extraordinary inspiration. And anytime we get a little bit self-satisfied or complacent, we just have to take a look at that encyclical and we realize there's a significant gap between our current reality, the way we're living, and what, he's, what he is asking us to do. And please. Well, I was gonna come back to just almost to do your first question a little bit and build in. Um, you say, how do you fight back against these, these people and, and what do you do with them? Um, the economic argument is actually the most powerful argument. And it's one we need to make more. It's the balance sheet ledger that I just talked about and the plus side. You start defining the plus side here. There really are millions of dollars. I mean, whoever it is who, you know, comes up with the cheaper kilowatt per hour, whiz bang, whatever it is, and uh, you know the next new thing. It, it's going to be an energy. I mean, this is the largest market in the world, folks. Larger even than the market that created the great wealth for America in the 1990s. It's a George gigantic market. As it is, we're going to be spending something like 17 trillion dollars in energy over the course of the next 10 years or so. And if we direct it in the right places, then you know, the market, by then those people looking for investment can bet on the future and begin to bet that their investment will see a greater ROI because you know there are going to be X number of more users and, and you begin to get your, your economies of scale in place and can make it work. That's going to happen. It, I mean, solar, before we saw the cratering of the price of oil, was 
almost one for one and, and was really making it. Uh, the diminishment, obviously, in the, in the cost of oil has unfortunately encouraged a lot of people to you know, stave off some of the investments and so forth. That's where we come in. We need to be helping in various ways, where OPEC can provide a support structure, and Elizabeth will talk to you about that later, or where we can create some kind of comparative uh, tax. I mean, why shouldn't we? After all, the same fossil fuel incentives that were put in place 40 years ago are still in place. It doesn't make sense. And if we were to begin to reverse some of those things or push in different directions, we will change the economics. And that's the best thing to happen of all. It'll beat all governance. When the marketplace is moving in this direction, no politician will be able to stop that. That's the secret. That's why all of you are so important. And if I, if I could put you on the spot, which I never, I never <laughs> do, Mr. Secretary, but with the election last night, and being the nerd that I am, I was up watching C-SPAN to watch Trudeau's acceptance speech, the victory speech, with a different government up to the north. Does that change the equation at all on your decision on Keystone? Uh, no, the, the, the decision on Keystone is being based on the merits and on the countervailing balance of all the input that has come from a very exhaustive agency review. I have said again and again, I want to get that done as fast as possible, and that is very true. I is want it to imminent? It. I'm not going to use the word. I, I just, it'll get done in its appropriate moment, but I would like to see it done as fast as possible. President Joy, you want I, to jump I, in? I, I did want to come back a little bit on the challenge of the encyclical. Um, because there's another way in which universities have tried to engage these questions in addition to the academic strength of our institutions, and that is all of us have tried to address the way in which we actually run our institutions, the, the way in which we conduct our work. And in 2005, a whole group of universities came together and made a commitment that we would try to reduce our carbon footprint. And for Georgetown, we made a commitment that we would try to reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2020. This was in 2005. So in early June of this year, we were very pleased that we were at 72% playing by the rules that were put in place in 2005. And I remember I was, I was out, in, out in the West and I was being asked on the day in which the encyclical was released to offer some comments on the day it was released. Well, fortunately, I had the hours difference. It was released at noon in Rome and I was a little later. So I'm looking at the encyclical trying to see what can I say about this. And right there was the challenge about using renewable and energy credits as a way of reducing your carbon footprint. So we were at 72% before I read the encyclical. Then after reading the encyclical, we were down below 50%, just a little below. Now we got to double our efforts. And we do this by the way in which we manage our energy, how we, how we conduct the business of the university, how we manage our, our, our fleets of, of buses and cars. But the Holy Father's challenge came right back immediately. No, no use of renewable energy credits to be able to accomplish your goal of carbon reduction. Yes, and then we have just a moment left, but let, let, let me ask Two you. very quick points. Uh, one on the pipeline. Uh, that is not crude that goes down there. It is diluted bitumen. And several years ago, there was a leak. A few thousand gallons only went in into the Kalamazoo River. Um, and then it was revealed what diluted bitumen does. First of all, in order to get it to throw down, flow down the pipeline, they have to mix it with benzene. So the first thing that happens is benzene evaporates. It's a poisonous brown gas and you have to evacuate everybody or they die. And then without benzene in, it's no longer crude oil, it sinks, it's heavier. Crude oil floats, diluted bitumen sinks to, to the bottom, rolls along the bottom of the river and ruins it for decades or hundreds of years. And the other uh, quick point was that in our foundation, we have 20% impact investing where we go out to make money, but to make money in things like um, lithium ion batteries at twice the efficiency, we hope, and solar and, and, and wind. You can make very handsome returns and, and move the dial in, within the context of endowments and foundations. And let me just, uh, we only have a, a moment left, uh, say, Mr. Secretary, as you shuttle around the world, and we are grateful that you're here for 24 hours before you're off again, uh, you recently spoke of the role that drought, climate change, played in the Syrian refugee crisis, you know, as one of the contributing factors. Clearly, 
This is a national security crisis, as are all of the other issues that you have on your plate. You're about to head off and uh, will likely end up in the region. The Israeli-Palestinian feud is escalating uh, by day, by night. Ban Ki-moon issued a video appeal to both sides last night to, to de-escalate, to show the courage of nonviolence. But this is a situation where you can't even meet with Netanyahu and Abbas in the same country because of all of the exacerbated tensions. How do you, as, uh, how does America play a role in mediating this crisis? Well, as you know, uh, I mean, I've, I've talked to President Abbas and I've talked to Prime Minister Netanyahu in the last few days, and we could meet if we chose to, but I think it's not, uh, uh, that meeting together in the same country is not, this is not the moment, obviously. Uh, but I will be meeting. I'll be meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu either in Germany or in the region. And I will be meeting with President Abbas and meeting with King Abdullah and others. And we will go back to some very basics here with respect to uh, what the expectations are for the administration of the Haram al-Sharif and the Temple Mount. And hopefully begin to open up enough political space to begin to move on, on, on some other areas. I think we have to have very careful expectations. I think we have to be very uh, aware of the sensitivities that have built up now uh, everywhere. Uh, and, and so uh, we have to move carefully. But I think the United States has a special role to play. We accept that responsibility. I accept it. And I look forward to these meetings as an opportunity to try to uh, pull people back from a precipice and, and try to move down a road because everybody understands that in the end it requires a political solution. It requires two states living side by side in peace with two peoples appropriately honored with their countries uh, and with security. And it takes leadership to get there. Uh, so we're going to do everything in our power to try to um, see if we can uh, calm things down and find a way forward. Do they have enough leadership? Uh, they have they have capable leaders. Sure, they do. They have. Uh, I mean, it's a question of making choices, and the people on the outside support structure of all the in neighboring countries uh, being available to help support uh, a transition. And I think many of those countries. I've been working with them now for several years. I believe they are prepared to be supportive of leadership that that tries to move uh, in a certain direction. And mind you, at the same time, we have. Um, the difficulties of Syria, and I will be meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and with other uh, engaged countries, uh, interested and, and important countries, and see if we can't simultaneously try to move that process forward. So I, I think, in, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Again, no expectations, but if you're not talking, if you're not trying, it's guaranteed you can't get there. So we're going to make our best effort. Well, you, you all now know from today's presentation how hard the Secretary of State works on all of these issues, for which he's being honored tonight as the Diplomat of the Year by Foreign Policy. So congratulations on that, and thank you for your service and all of your service. Thank you all for being here. Have a great session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man.